Hey guys, thanks for joining us. This is Chris and I'm here with Nick. Hey, hey. And today we're, uh, we're in a little bit of a unique vehicle. You know, we do so much with diesel, hence the Diesel Performance Podcast. Uh, but today we're in a 2020 Ford Raptor. Ford Raptor. So a little bit of background, over at Calibrated Power, we've been playing with the EcoBoost platform, whether it's the 3.5, the 3 liter, or the 2.7. Um, we've been doing tuning on EasyLink and some other add-ons, upgrades over the years. Um, and now we started getting into R&D on turbochargers. So uh, Nick, kind of fill us in a little bit, like, you know, what's the R&D process been like? Um, what are some of the similarities, I think, between a Raptor, uh, or the 3.5 rather, and some of the diesel platforms, yeah. and why did we adopt this, this platform? Yeah, well, I like the EcoBoost platform because it drives, I wouldn't say like a diesel, but similar to a diesel. Uh, you got a, a small engine that's taking advantage of a pretty good amount of boost. I mean, these engines will run close to 20 pounds of boost, tuned uh, sometimes even more than that. And they make really good torque, they're fun to drive, they get pretty decent mileage, they tow well. Um, you know, really the only limitation is, is fuel system. Um, and by that I mean like combustion stability. So on, on diesel you don't have pre-ignition, you don't have detonation, you don't have any of that to worry about. With gasoline, you know, you have to manage your spark. Yep. But otherwise, um, they're, they're snappy little engines and they're, and they're a lot of fun. Now these are twin turbo and from yep. the factory they're like a low 30 millimeter inducer or something yeah, like that? depends on what year you're talking about. Okay. But the later models, which are what we really favor, the 17 plus. Uh, the F-150 is like a 39 millimeter compressor and there's two of them. And okay. then the Raptor, uh, which 18 plus in the platinum trucks, which are rated higher than 450 horse. Uh, those are all 40, 40.8 or 41 millimeter okay. inducers. Okay. So, what kind of boost do these things make? You know, tuned up, like, you know, full full tilt, yeah, you're running yeah. uh, an ethanol blended fuel. What kind of boost can we see out of a gas so, engine like this? These trucks make about 365, 370 to the tire okay. stock. They're rated at 450. You know, it depends on what dyno you're on, but let's just call it 375 for fun, right? Um, 375 stock, when, when we tur turn them up, we'll get to like, we're around 20 pounds of boost, 20, 21 pounds oh, of boost, okay. depending on what the outside air temperature is intercooler has been upgraded, that kind of stuff. Um, when they're making that kind of boost, they're picking up about 110 rear wheel horsepower. Okay. So call it 480, 485, 490, somewhere around there to the tire. Um, and then we really just kind of run out of airflow from the turbocharger. So we're looking at like 50 pounds of air per minute uh, from both turbochargers combined. And then that's where, that's where we kind of yeah. are today, which was, Hey, the turbochargers appear to be the limiting factor. Of course. Let's do what we like to do, and that is build stealth turbos. Yeah. No, I think, you know, a lot of similarities platform to platform, right? We're talking we're talking diesel truck boost pressures, right? 20 yep. pounds. We're talking diesel truck style up rates, you know? There's a lot of gas engines that are naturally aspirated where, you know, you tune them and you might only pick up 10, maybe 15 horsepower. Yep. Um, but you could literally take one of these EcoBoost platforms and turn them up to that expected 100 horsepower, 120 horsepower, which, you know, that's what we're super familiar that's with. That's a value, you know what I mean? When you can give a customer 100 horsepower, like now we're talking yep. what we do that's our business right so naturally right we do diesel stuff you tune them you see the weak links there turbochargers generally being the next weak link yeah. we start getting in the manufacturing on that uh r d and then manufacturing what's been the process and what's the difference in getting into okay we're going to r d a single turbocharger in a diesel application versus hey we're going to r d twin turbos on a gasoline application yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, we looked at, I'll kind of walk you through the R&D process on the turbocharger. So what we looked at was at 50 pounds per minute, 52 pounds per minute. That's what factory That's chargers what are capable of? Factory chargers okay. max out at. So you really sort of push a lot of hot air after yeah. that. And usually 10 pound, or one pound per minute is good for 10 horsepower okay. on, on good fuel, right? So let's say we're not worried about timing. We're not really pulling back on timing a lot, um, which, which means on ethanol or on race gas, we're talking a 525 horsepower setup, okay. right? It's higher. So, my my position is I own a Raptor. I own this Raptor. The business owns this Raptor. I know that the main competition for this truck is the TRX. Right. I know a lot of Raptor owners see the TRX as kind of like the you know the big swinging dick on the block. Well, so V8 supercharged, V8 right? Supercharged, yeah. nasty setup, right? So if if I'm a Raptor owner, which I am, I think well, I think it'd be fun to beat the stock TRX. That might be a nice goal for my mod yeah. list. So I'm looking at the weight, I'm doing the calculations. I know that my tuned Raptor can run right around a 13.0 on 93 octane and somewhere in the 12s on, on E85. Um, 
So I'm looking, really what I'm looking for is like six and a quarter, 650 horsepower. Like I think that's a good, reliable, like you should outrun a TRX or be right on top of the TRX. Yeah. And minimal gain, minimal yeah. upgrades too. Like yeah. there's not a ton of upgrades it's, at that point. It's not crazy. It's not like race truck stuff, but it's, it's a nice bolt on upgrade. And so what I'm looking for there is I'm like, okay, how much airflow do I need? Mm -hmm. Right. So I need to calculate that. If I'm looking for 625, you know, we just talked about 10, 10 horsepower per pound per minute. So naturally 62, 63 pounds per minute is yep. kind of what I'm looking for. So then we kind of back into, okay, what size compressor wheel do we need? Okay, so I really like the 46 millimeter. It'll just put me a little bit over that. 63 pounds should give me a little extra. And then I gotta pick a turbine that's yep. the right size to drive that. Does now, that answer your question on it the does. Side? It does. Okay. Now I think in the gasoline engines, being that you know you have uh, two turbos, they're way skated, correct? Um, drive pressure, I'm sure you know that's where you're going to pair the turbine, and you know is drive pressure as big of a, a a thing to worry about like we talk about in the diesel world? Is that much of a thing at all? Um, so we're not, we're not we don't have a gauge on drive pressure right. in the factory. The the truck is basically calculating drive pressure based on an airflow model. Okay. Um, what we're looking for is to maintain similar ratios. So. In our design, you know, in engineering, it's like, okay, we know that this size compressor can be supported by this size turbine. Yep. If we're going to upgrade the, the compressor by a certain amount, we're going to proportionally, proportionally yeah. yep, on the turbine side and take what's basically our, our closest guess and mm -hmm. hopefully we get pretty close on that and can make use of it. Okay. As an outcome, you know, here's a here's a, a finished product, right, that's on here. Yeah. What are, what are we in today? What are we driving? So this truck has the set of 46 millimeter turbos on it. Okay. And I'm kind of working through the, the process here. I have proved it out. I have seen uh, 65 pounds per minute out of these turbochargers. I have the truck on good fuel right now. So it's got it's got timing in it. Okay. Uh, so let, let, let's yeah. talk a little bit about the fuel, right? Because, you know, us diesel guys, right? Do we think diesel fuel is number two from the pump and that's that. When we talk gasoline and we talk yeah. ethanol, uh, there's a lot of different variations that can come into this. You know, we talk pump gas, 80, 87, 89, 91, 93, depending on where you're located. Yep. And then we talk about ethanol blends, running pump gas and uh, E85 is a, is a blend to get to a specific alcohol percentage that you want to run. Or you can run straight E85, which is generally around 70, 80% ethanol mm -hmm. um, from a pump. Um, when you get into those ethanol style fuel systems, uh, you generally, or fuel, being the, the the fuel source, you generally need to run a little bit different on the fuel system side, injectors, pumps, stuff like that. Yeah. So what does that look like on a setup like this? So the good news on these gas vehicles is that, is that injectors and pumps are cheaper. Okay. Uh, so this truck has a stock fuel pump in the tank. It has a set of 1050 uh, injectors in the engine. It's a direct inject fuel system, but also port inject. So okay. we didn't upgrade the direct inject system, only upgraded the port side, and then bias the truck towards running on the port side okay. under high load. So basically take load off the direct inject system and switch it over to the port injection system, which has been upgraded okay. under high load, right? So we have that stuff uh, upgraded. I also have a, a voltage booster on the in-tank pump. To help so with fuel supply. I found that the in-tank pump is good for on straight E85, good for about 550 rear wheel horsepower. Okay. After that, we run out of, of pressure in the, in the low side. So we're gonna take the voltage up from about 15 volts to uh, about 21 volts under high load. Okay. And what that's going to do is really bump up the output of the fuel system and hopefully get us to keep uh, keep good low pressure, okay. keep those port injectors firing well. Now what I've seen in some gasoline applications, it's common to have like two pumps in the tank or even three pumps in the tank and it's generally a reference by boost pressure yeah. when that second pump kicks on to keep up with fuel volume sure. this is essentially like the gateway to that we're not getting super aggressive in the fuel system just yet because those do get costly yeah um but this is more or less kind of like uh the entry level like the bare bones to make it work see what it can do yeah this is you know if I don't have to have you drop your fuel tank I prefer not to have you drop your fuel tank so mm -hmm. this company JMS makes a nice uh, throttle position referenced fuel uh, fuel pump voltage okay. booster. It looks at throttle position and then jumps in in a certain throttle position and kind of ramps up. Okay, uh, so it's not at a constant. It's not at that a point. constant deal. It's not overheating your fuel. It's not you know, pulling a ton of amperage when it's not needed. Okay. And in the log files, you can look at the low pressure system and say like, is it is it coming in too hot? Is it coming in too soft? Is it 
coming in like it's supposed to, and you can tune that. You can calibrate that. that. Yeah. Nice. All weather pack connectors. There's no butt connectors. There's no no bullshit. No scotch locks. Nothing like okay. that. It's, it's really a pretty easy install. Um, so I'm I'm pretty happy with it. And I think you know our goal is to make it as simple as possible for yeah. the customers. I mean, yeah, a nasty dual pump setup would be would be cool, but it's not necessarily a necessity exactly. at this point. It's not something that you have to do. So what kind of power does this truck make currently from what you've seen in the log files? Maybe it's been on the dyno. Where are we estimating this setup as kind of like a, a bolt-on-esque setup with turbos? Where are we at? Yeah, so the la I'll just tell you, the last time I had this truck on a dyno, it was right at that 550 number. I took it out on the street. It was right about the same. I was, I was fighting with intake air temps, so we put an um, AMS intercooler on it. Okay. Did a nice write-up on that on the, on the blog stuff. We were having a really hard time controlling inlet air temps. It's summertime here. Inlet air temps were... You know, going up like right. this as I'm on the throttle. Now the inlet air temps are really under control. I was seeing that um, the throttle blade was open all the way, which means it was working as hard as right. it could. And I, I still have the stock air box on it. So okay. with the stock air box, stock cats, stock exhaust, I was at 550 horsepower. That's impressive. Okay. Okay. So that was totally stock setup. So I just put an S and B air box on it. I put the AMS intercooler on it. It still has stock exhaust on it. So I'm I'm just kind of seeing like. Where that limitation what, lies, yeah, what right. the log files tell me as far as airflow, like as I'm pushing this thing up. I haven't had it back on the dyno since we did the, the fuel pump booster and the uh, uh, S&B intake. My thought is looking at the log files, we're probably right at that 600 okay. number as it sits right now. I mean, that's impressive. Um, yeah, I mean, the truck, you know. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it just pulls and carries you. Yeah, the truck runs, yeah. it runs strong, man. Yeah. Tell you what, I don't, I don't blame you wanting to keep the stock exhaust on there because these things with the exhaust, it's a different tone, it's a, it's a different sound altogether. Yeah. The stock stuff it sounds really good. It's got a good tone to yeah. it. The, the truck is moving a lot of air, yeah. and I'm, I'm sure that the stock exhaust is not appreciating it. And once right. I, when it goes to straight 93 octane, the cats run a lot hotter. Okay. And it's, that really can get you in trouble as far as pulling, pulling power out of the system to try and control the cat temps. Um, but with the E85, that's not really an issue. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, you know, once we go to that, like, let's see how much power we can cap these turbos out. Yeah. Of course, we're gonna, you know, upgrade the exhaust, the higher flow cats, and the bigger pipes, and the cap back, and everything, which is honestly probably worth 40 horsepower if I had to guess, just based on what I've seen on similar power level trucks. I mean, yes. Yeah. Exhaust is sized for 365 right. rear wheel horsepower. And here we are, you yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> knocking on the door. So. I mean, you get on it like that. I think. You know this platform has a strong following and it's gaining popularity every day yeah and i mean we've I mean, granted been working for you now 10 years nine years and there's a lot of guys where they've come from the diesel arena into one of these because maybe they don't need to tow as much weight the diesel just really isn't there but they still want to have fun and have a multi-facet truck yeah. um and this man back there you just you romped on it you stood on it and that thing just came right to life like this you know it, it very pops. responsive yeah yeah well that's the stealth program you know we're really about maintaining drivability and anytime you upsize turbochargers you know i know it's a compromise yep. right so if you're going to upset if you're going to upsize your turbochargers make sure you upsize them only as much as you need because whatever extra you put in there you're going to pay for in drivability yep. and i'm going to say you know these do not spool as quickly as stock it's it's you know just be honest but mm -hmm. transparent right Whereas the stock one, you can like lug it at like 12, 1300 RPM and you this get, isn't gonna you do get that. it come right to life. These, you're about 500 RPM later, which, you know, with the trans tune and a little adjustment, um, you'll never notice it because we'll right. cover it up. We won't, we won't put the truck in a situation where it has to do that. Instead, it'll, you grab one gear down, the 10 speed trans can cover it up really easily. So, right. I mean, I'm telling you stuff that you probably wouldn't even notice right. driving it. But, you know, that's that's the way it is. But to the guy that maybe decides he wants to do a turbo upgrade and let's say he has a tune but not a trans tune or right. he had a turbo failure and he decided to upgrade without doing tuning in general, these are things that you need to consider and look out for yes. that it's a pair, it's a package. It's a, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's built to be within those constraints. We want it to be, you know, easily tunable. I want anybody, any tuner out there to be able to work with these turbochargers. They have to pass, um, you know, pass carb. So we've done our in-house reasonable basis testing. The data that we've collected so far indicates that we should have no no problem at all getting an EO on these. So I'm really, you know, really excited about that. That shows that you can put them on a stock truck yeah. and they drive great. Doesn't doesn't adversely impact emissions, which means 
it doesn't adversely impact drivability. There you go. Yeah. Now, what kind of weight? I mean, I always get these types of questions where, well, if I add a tune and I add turbos, I can tow more weight, <laughs> right? Sure, sure. Um, you know, there's a limitation of what the, the chassis is capable of, of handling, but I would assume with, you know, improving the transmission's uh, shift schedule and adding some of that, uh, adding to that power band, more or less, like yeah. these things are gonna, you know, tow some decent weight, you know, comfortably. I'll talk to you about the power side, right? The brakes and the chassis, um, you know, that's not exactly my department as far as telling you how much weight those things can handle. But on the power side, I'll tell you that it's all about thermal management. And what I mean by that is if you can keep the temperature down on the intake air charge, you can keep the truck in power longer and you can really use the truck for towing um, heavier weight. So when you start running the truck hard on power, the factory intercooler becomes uh, an issue. It right. dumps a lot of heat. Uh, it puts a lot of heat into the engine which then goes into the coolant, which then goes into the radiator. Um, and then once that intake air temp goes above 120 degrees, the truck's gonna start pulling power on you. So no matter what is in your tune, it should be pulling power out as your right. intake air temps crest over that 120 and head towards 150. Now there's guys out there tuning that don't respect that. No, <laughs> and right. they're gonna push the truck into the never, never land. And that's gonna be a bad day for you, but you know, that, that's, that's not here or there. Really, it's, it's thermal management. So if you get a good intercooler on the truck, you keep the truck at the RPM where it's happy, you know what I mean, where the turbos are operating efficiently and they're moving a lot of air, like that's gonna keep the system you know, running efficiently and, and keep heat off of it. Um, it. If you just wanna blast it, which a lot of guys who own these things are just, you know what I mean, they're not towing heavy right. sustained loads. Let's be honest, they're not hot shot guys. And no. by, by heavy, I don't mean like, pulling your Malibu up a hill. Like right. the truck will do that no problem, right? I'm talking like put a freaking tag trailer on it of with course. something stupid and, and be lugging it for indefinitely. Like that's just not what these things are designed for. So with that being said, I would assume we're gonna be taking this thing to the track at some point here shortly yeah. to kind of back up the yeah. power. Yeah. Um, it's one thing to make the power on a dyno, but it's also another thing to back that up at the track the and track. say, hey, here's usable power. Right, exactly. The track's where it's at. I mean, if we can't get into the 11s with this truck, like I'm, it's not a success, right? Like I want to be able to beat that TRX. Um, you know, I want to be able to. I'm just gonna put it in sport mode here. There you go. Turn off the old advanced track. Traction control off. Um, you know, we just, just gotta beat the TRX. So. Five, 26 pounds of boost at one point on the dash you saw the yep. thing just got up and went these are this, this is a 35 on here or 37s it's 35 stock 35 got fresh bfgs on it you can hear it you can hear them tires. chirping them right yeah. that's you know we're, we're <laughs> it's a big we're, wide tire full weight. It's on, the spares on you and i in the truck I yeah, mean, yeah. It's, it, and it's 85 degrees out that's so, wild I mean, that's impressive ac blasting AC and everything blasting. you know yeah exactly oh I mean, that's yeah. that's insane I'm really excited to see what happens next. I mean, what's, you know, we talk fuel system stuff. We have the add a, add a pump into the mix here or, you know, whatever that looks like. Is there gonna be a limitation on the injector side? Like, what is the limitation as we move forward? Is it engine, is it fuel system? Like, what are we facing? I, I kind of feel like that 550 foot pounds seems to be the limit of, of long-term health on these engines. Okay. I mean, you know, let's be realistic. They're built for 365 rear right. horsepower, right? So. There's only so much power we're going to be able to throw at the truck reliably. Okay. Regardless of if we have enough fuel, if we have enough air, if it's injected at the right time, whatever. There's only, you know, this, the bottom end is only good for so much power. And so I'm just, I don't want to put customers in a position where they're calling me a month later, like, hey. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned something that we haven't discussed. With a truck like this, making that 600 horsepower mark, what are we looking at for torque on something like that? When the truck was on the dyno last, making that 550 yeah. number, where were we torque wise? Yeah, so that 550 torque number is really where I'm kind of capping it. Okay. So I'm just I'm trying to shape the power curve so that it'll carry 550 out a little longer. So instead of shifting the truck early, we might pull another 500 RPM or 1000 RPM or whatever, um, you know, because we have the bigger turbos right. and that extra RPM, even at the same torque is gonna carry the power there curve out. 
There you go. And I would assume, uh, you know, like you had mentioned, you know, bumping up that RPM for the shifting, the turbos are going to be a part of that to help kind of keep that torque out of the bottom end. Yeah, exactly. The smaller, you know, small stock turbos are going to get choked up when you start shifting higher and you start running the, running the hours out higher. Uh, but the bigger turbos, they appreciate that. Yeah. You know, and same with, you know, like I said, the stock exhaust system, like, that doesn't exactly appreciate high RPM operations. So at some point, we're going to probably have to match that up. And, well, it seems like you've been enjoying the truck so far, right? As far like as it, the platform I mean, as a whole. You know, the Raptor's a fun ass truck to drive anyway. You got awesome suspension, you got great response. Like, it's a nice truck to drive. And then to have this kind of torque and this kind of power in the yeah. platform, it's fun. Very good. Well, I appreciate you taking the time, going for a ride, kind of talking about the platform, talking about the turbochargers and the R&D process. Um, you know, we're probably going to have you back on here before too long, maybe after we, uh, you know, get some dyno time, maybe get to the track um, and kind of maybe do maybe do a comparison, maybe do a comparison against this, against the diesel with a stealth turbo or something along those lines yeah. and, uh, you know, see what that shapes up and what that looks like. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate being on the show. It's always fun to share what's new and yeah. hopping. And, uh, yeah, thanks, Bill. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching or listening. Stay tuned for more Diesel Performance Podcast. Hey, guys. It's Jeremy from the Diesel Performance Podcast. This week, we're going to talk about the 2011 Ford that we had talked about last week. Um, I have an update for you. Uh, last week, I was going through a no start problem. That was the customer's complaint. And I had found out that the interior had no power. So uh, along with a no start, I had no interior lights, no cluster, no radio, anything of that sort. So after that, I got into it and I di you know, started diving into it a little bit. What was I missing? Um, am I missing power? Am I missing ground? Um, the truck is definitely a little rusty. Um, it's hard to tell from this angle and where I'm standing, but um, I wanted to figure out what I was actually missing. Was I missing grounds or power, stuff like that? I did figure it out. Um, what I figured out was that I had a bad power wire going into the cab from the battery from a multi-fuse junction. Um, that's the best way to explain it. So this junction has... Um, four to five mega fuses on it, um, 175 to 200 amp fuses. So one of the legs coming off of that big, huge junction mega fuse um, was bad. So with that being bad, inside the truck only had about four volts. And I, of course you need 12 volts in a 12 volt system. So um, once I was able to trace my power problem and figuring out it was actually a power problem, I was able to trace that back to the battery and I did a voltage drop from the battery to the inside of the cab where my inside of the fuse box is and found that's where I found my problem. So needless to say, um, instead of putting a $500 little junction block on this thing, I did a professional repair, but a a neat repair. Uh, so what I did is I added my own 200 amp fuse to it. So the leg that was broken um, and corroded, I actually cut that out and I added my own 200 amp circuit to that. So not using the factory one or using the factory junction block, I just added another leg to that, did that and got the truck started and got everything running inside. So Patience was the key on this one. You know, it literally took me patience and to go over the diagnostic procedure. What was I missing? What was I not missing? And that's how I determined it was a bad power problem from the battery. And that's what I got for you this week. I just want to give you guys that update and uh, tell you what I had found on this truck because last week I wasn't sure. And now I got it all fixed up and it's good to go. So, if you like what you're seeing, just give me a follow. Give us a follow at Diesel Performance Podcast. Uh, keep listening, and uh, we'll try to give you some more content next week. Thanks. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Uh, this has been Paul Wilson. And Chris Emke. Make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll talk to you again soon. Uh, uh, why don't you bring us in? I feel like you guys usually do that. We do.